I'm taking a deep breath. Hold on. All right. It can be a dark world sometimes. Don't be afraid to be a source of light. It can be a dark world sometimes. Don't be afraid to be a source of light. Peace, good people. Peace. No, no, no. It goes by like this. Peace, Sacramento. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Soul Affirmations with Felicia and Kariga. It's actually with Kariga and Felicia. It says that on the flyer. And that's why I say every episode with Kariga and Felicia. <laughs> and the listeners on the Black Love Podcast Network. <laughs> and our audience here tonight with us here in Sacramento, California. Hey. Make some noise for yourselves. And, and this time, Riggy, you can ask how they feeling. I can really ask them how they feeling. Yeah. How y'all feeling? That's wild. Wow. <laughs> wow. I usually answer for them, but this is nice to have you all here with us. No, it does feel really secure. Yeah. I, I So usually, I start with an affirmation. I pick an affirmation based on how we're feeling today. Okay. And um, I guess this will be no different. Unless you have one, Riga. I'll let you ride with it. All right. You know what? Let's actually tell them a little bit more about this space, and then I'll pick an affirmation. There we go. Yeah, I like that. So if you look around, you might see familiar faces. Some are your faces. A lot are ours. But it tells our story. And when we decided to, to come into this space, there were a few themes that came up for us in our story. And uh, one of them was reframe. The other was reconciliation. And another theme was grief is not a linear process. Mm -hmm. And... So you'll see the photos, and if you know our story, you might be able to see and tell what part of the story you're looking at. But you would, go ahead. You would say, oh, go ahead. oh, I thought you were say something. But you also may note that they're not exactly in order for that very reason. This process has not been a linear process at all, but it has been one that has required pivots. It's been one that has required reframing. And it has been one for me that has required reconciliation with myself. And so to the left, you'll see this mirror. And I found it important to put it here because when I gave birth to Kamayu, Kariga was with me when I went to the bathroom for the very first time after. And I looked at myself in the mirror for the first time. And it was one of the most difficult reflections I've ever seen because here I am, I had a baby, but I had a baby that wasn't in my arms and how that felt. I was very, very, for lack of better words, I might have written somewhere that I was really just disgusted with what had just happened. And this, since then, I have spent time having to reframe and also having to forgive myself, um, having to learn how to thank my body um, and reconcile with who I thought I was going to be and who I am now and who I was becoming. Mm. So you'll find the mirror here as a representation of that. Speaking of the mirror, I'd like to maybe reflect for the listener who isn't in the room. We are in Sacramento, California. The Brickhouse Art Gallery and Complex located in Old Park, and this particular building holds so much of our story. If you saw the Baby Bailey Girl video, Lauren sang right out there on that patio as we were expecting with joy our firstborn. So I give that as a context for the listener who isn't in the room so they can feel where we are. Um, many of them may have met us at that story. Yeah, you're right. You're right. And I think, I remember OG once said to me, you know, he was talking about how 
time moves on. And I, I never liked that. I never liked it. I never liked it when I held the, heard the elders say it. I thought it was insensitive. I thought there was a way to hold more. But when you truly begin to live a couple of moons, a couple of suns, a couple of cycles, you do understand the nature of time and as it keeps moving. Uh, but time doesn't have to equal distance and the love doesn't have to be far from us. In fact, time is the only measure I found that can adequately measure love. It takes time to know love. It takes time to mature love. And it takes time for love to reveal to you just how enduring it is. So time in this case didn't move us further away from love or further away from Kamayu. It just brings us closer each day. Insofar as we have returned back to the very same room where we celebrated her. Mm. So this is evidence to me that love and time, it grows. Wow. It doesn't separate. Wow. So for the listener as well, I think it's important to paint the picture. I gave you the imagery of the mirror to my left. Um, but also, Karig and I are sitting on the couch. And we have created our living room vibe uh, that is equipped with our blankets, our pillows, uh, the Kamayu bear. If anybody is familiar with this bear, I might have talked about it before, but this bear is actually the weight of Kamayu when she was born. So it was given to me by um, Molly Bear, which is another organization that supports mothers who have experienced loss and they give free bears and the weight of your baby. So right here, if anybody wants to hold it. Uh, <laughs> and um, we've got our knickknacks, but I also want to point out that we've got our Atmo vibe in the house. <laughs> The Atmo vibe has to be in the house. It is so intricate and so important to our home that I had to bring it here. And we're so grateful that Brittany also joined us and she has Atmo outside for sale. So if anybody wants to experience the atmosphere that she brings in the home, point Truly that beautiful. out. <laughs> Absolutely. And also to my right, we have what I would call the Kamayu Corner. And it is a, a space that is a reflection of the space in my home where I spend my time writing to Kamayu. So it has some of her pieces. It has a quilt that was made by my very good friend, Jabrilla, her grandmother, Jeanette Robinson, and her auntie, Terry Green. And that quilt made it into a nationwide recognized quilt magazine called Quilt Folk. Um, we also have Baby Bailey Girl, mm -hmm. picture of her with Kariga, some of the books that aided in um, my process, and also my book that comes from my writings. So. And you'll see a painting of my brother Kareem um, done by Mel Waters. And that painting lives downstairs with us sometimes, uh, but often in Kamayu and Kamali's room. I figure uncle just keeps an extra watchful eye. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, Greg, do you, I know we kind of briefly talked about grief as not being a linear process, but did you want to talk a, a bit about how the pictures found their positioning? Uh, maybe it'll come into play in the conversation. Okay. Uh, I'm thankful for the folks in the room. I'm thankful for the folks listening. Yeah. Uh, but I really want to just honor how I'm feeling right now. And maybe um, the photos speak so much for themselves. Maybe we'll talk about them later, but I think right now I'm just a little, I can feel it all. Mm. I can feel it all. And um, that has proven to be an increased ability. It isn't disabling. The capacity to feel. I recognize, however, that I'm privileged to take time to examine those feelings 
And it is out of that privilege that we produce writings and spaces because not everybody has the time to check in. And I so critically understand that truth. But if we can begun, begin to create more spaces and more habits of mind that allow the check-in to be a part of our daily fabric, we can be more well. I'm with you, Fee. All right. So I found the affirmation based on how I started here. And if you have your affirmation books, your text, anybody got their books in the house? Okay, okay, a couple people. Turn to page 38. Yep, yep, turn to page 38. Touch your neighbor, tell them it's page 38. With consent. With consent. Nope. Touch them with consent. Stop. I'm no. sorry. No, nah, don't, no. Nah. <laughs> See? Nope. And it reads. Don't touch me. <laughs> Today I acknowledge the gift of impermanence. Neither struggle nor ease will last forever, so I learn to have respect for them both. Hmm. I heard some snaps. Today I acknowledge the gift of impermanence. Neither struggle nor ease will last forever, so I learn to have respect for them both. Neither struggle nor ease will last forever, so I learn to have respect for them both. I think about... Uh, let me just lay it true. I think about everything I felt leading up to you entering this room. Mm. The logistics, the doing a gallery installation with a newborn, <laughs> the communication, the temperature. <laughs> no, these are all things that are like in my head, like what do I do about this? What do I do about that? And the other day, Felicia and I and Lamar hosted a dinner for some friends at our place for their anniversary. And I told Felicia, not only did I appreciate doing it, but doing it under the, the way life works now, I told her it made me feel more confident about this. Mm. Because I remember the butterflies I had before they arrived and wanting everything to be right. Mm. But I know that perfection doesn't exist, but where my heart resides and where my mind resides matters a great deal to what I experience and what you experience. So the portion about neither struggle nor ease lasting forever, but I learned to have respect for them both. Imagine wanting to host folks who are really only coming to hold you. Mm. That's the way I feel right now. I went through all these hoops on what would make it just right, and it's actually you. Mm. I could feel the intention. The love that was offered before now was incredibly empowering. The way you all made space for fee virtually, text, phone call, in person, that was empowering. So I feel empowered right now. Um, I wouldn't say this is the ease, but I feel like the difficulty has subsided. Mm. I'm present. Mm. I care to be present. Um, I'm present beyond the point of production. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like with each person from the roads we travel, I'm present and thank you. Yeah, this is this is super unique, right? This is this is completely different. Now, when Kariga and I do this, we are literally across from each other. So I'm looking at all of you, and I I feel the warmth, I feel the holding. Yeah. And I can't deny it, man. I really emotional when I walked in and saw all those familiar faces. Mm. Some faces I haven't seen since the baby shower here, Kamayu's yeah. baby shower. Yeah. So um, I'm just incredibly grateful that you all have followed our story in the way that you have and held us in the way that you have. When Fee says follow our story, I think that's a perfect place for me to enter in what I'm feeling in the room. I never had an imagination that included today. Mm. 
Nothing in my plans told me that we would come together like this today. Mm. But I'm so grateful I experienced the things outside of my plans that have expanded my heart, my capacity to love, the way I re- interact with it. And it makes me think deeply about the agency and the story and the healing that's present in this room and present for this city. Mm. So I just wanted to speak to that very clearly, that I, I desire for this to be an exchange by which the story that you may be cultivating or sitting on or afraid of sharing, that this encourages you to lean into that. I, I believe that our liberation is connected in all of our wellness and all of our truth, and there's room for you. Mm. Just like y'all have made room for us, there's room for you. Mm. Sophie, we are here um, for your book signing. Yeah. We have, we talked about the book, we talked about some of the writing, but we are here because this audience believes in you Mm. and the love that you exude through your writing. I'm not trying to throw a trick question out there, but how does that feel (laughs) to see these people here for you? I don't think I've, um, I don't think I fully processed it. I'm going to be honest. Uh, This is, I never wanted anything to come from this experience. Mm. I've said that multiple times and I've, I've meant it on October 10th. I have a writing in my phone that I just had to get out. And from that writing, I said to Kariga that I don't want anything to come from this experience. I don't want anyone to make reason as to why this happened to me. I don't want an overpowering narrative. I I don't want anything to come from this. That that was how I that was as best as I could say it. But I also said that day that I want people when they see me that they see me as Kamayu's mom, and I don't want to be rushed back into a world that says I have to do certain things. I don't want to be pushed back into a job that does not see Kamayu as my daughter. Mm. And so it's so very unique to be sitting here with you and now at this moment and the evidence that I am Kamayu's mother on the walls, right? The evidence that I am her mother through through the book. The evidence that you are her mother through the hearts. Through the hearts. You said you didn't want to be pushed back into a world or pushed back into a work world that didn't recognize Kamayu as your daughter. And what we're speaking about is how there's like the sentimental truth, but then how employers can also interpret or the state can interpret what is a child and what isn't a child. Right. And if it doesn't meet a certain requirement, then it is not a child. Right. Although we very much know her to be true and real. So the, the very truth that, thinking that nothing would come from this because you didn't want to go back to that. But we were totally unaware of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That it wasn't just that polar opposite Mm -hmm. or nothing at all. Mm -hmm. But that along the way there would be a new becoming, a new fabric of connection, new seeds that were planted, and they would have to be watered by the sharing of your testimony. Mm -hmm. I remember how challenging it was when I heard my wife tell me nothing can come from this. Like the waiting I had to do on God and the serving I had to do for her was such a conundrum because I didn't want to put my thoughts, feelings, or philosophy against hers, but I could not rest in a place that says nothing could come from this. But I couldn't rest there because of my past lived experiences. If nothing could come from this, if that was what I allowed myself to know to be true, 
about my life as I've lived it and those who have come and transitioned along the way and my big brother Kareem, if I told myself nothing would come from this, I wouldn't know how to stand in this. Mm. So there's like a, the lived experiences, they just, they loop and they layer and they loop and they layer. And what my hope is that God advances me through time and experiences when I show evidence of submission in the season. Because you can't rush time. <laughs> mm. you, you can't rush God. You can't rush healing. You can't rush the journey. Mm -hmm. it, every day requires being present. Mm -hmm. Felicia, I think there's an affirmation in your book. Is it near? You know what? Well, I think I might have memorized it. Hold on, <laughs> if I memorize it. It says, sometimes art is showing up differently. Sometimes the art is showing up to the day differently than you've done before. Sometimes, say it again for me, please. Sometimes the art is showing up to the day differently than you've done before. Sometimes the art is showing up to the day differently than you've done before. The level of depth and introspection she went to to retrieve that for us as an offering for all of us in here. Like, let's just examine that. Sometimes the art is showing up today differently than you've done before. But sometimes in the routine of life and what Mondays feel like and Tuesdays feel like and Wednesdays and I got to pick up the kids by this time and we got an appointment by this time. So you build this repetition around a schedule in which you're hoping to maximize the way you use time. But in that schedule, in the rigidity of that schedule, we sometimes show up to the day the way we think the day requires of us. It's, it's what today requires. Mm -hmm. But like embedded in that is also this art to showing up to the day for what it calls from you. Now I recognize that takes courage and also can be a privilege but for anybody who has the time or the privilege to show up to the day, to choose to be present, there is an art in that. Mm -hmm. And if we took the time to reflect on it, it would reveal so much to us about our thoughts, our feelings, our habits of mind. I appreciate you reminding me where that comes from, Riga. Because I, I, vividly, I vividly remember those experiences wanting to just be true to who I was that day. Mm -hmm. Waking up and feeling the grief and choosing to be present with the grief is not an easy choice because mm -hmm. it doesn't always feel good, right? And it's different than the day usually is. But like we always say, like different doesn't mean deficit. Difference doesn't mean deficit. Difference does not mean deficit. And I think that that is also one of the entry points to understanding love more abundantly. Mm -hmm. uh, because we, we can't withhold, anybody who we withhold love from, we truly only withhold it from ourselves. Because we have to make a choice to not engage with somebody by love. And the moment you've made the choice, it's different when you haven't made a choice yet Let's just be clear. Operationally, there's outside, there's the public. Let's just say there's general wealth, your safety, right? So it doesn't mean that you oppose that person. It means that your first priority is your safety or your children's safety. So the love is just the general contract. But that's in places where they aren't making choices. But anytime you know that you have made a choice not to love someone, to your fullest capacity, mm. it's only interrupting you. We, love withheld, you, you can't weaponize it. Like you can't spike someone out of love. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it also requires you to engage in spaces and people who are reciprocal in that love, right? Mm -hmm. No matter how abundantly we talk about loving, we're talking about this practice of reciprocity. 
And that is, and I don't love you expecting you to love me back. I love you expecting that the love that I put in this world will find me on the day that I need it. So I must put this love out and I must not withhold it from somebody who is deserving of it or qualified to be loved. And even if the person who I am giving this love to is not fully capable of loving me back that way, I wasn't doing it for their return. I was doing it for the return. So I say to you, Fee, the places, the secret rooms that I saw you go to to write, the tears I couldn't dry. Like imagine watching your partner write, tears falling, um, but it, it, it doesn't mean they aren't okay. It means they're feeling something. But there's many of days where I'm talking loud downstairs, I want her to see something. I go upstairs to find her and she's in a totally different world than the one I'm in. And I make room to receive that and respect that. You know what it reminds me of? What? When, when I was younger, when me and my siblings were younger, like mom didn't have a scheduled prayer time. It would just happen whenever it was happening. <laughs> and you could really, 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 really want to just ask, can you go outside to play? Your partners is at the door, they playing ball, but you can't ask during prayer. You just can't. So you just taking that to the neck. Like, man, I can't even ask. Do I just go or <laughs> it, it, it brought up all those old feelings, but similarly, Felicia, very similar to the way I would feel when I found my mother praying at times that I didn't think was happening. That's the way I would feel when I walked into you while you were writing. I just let it be. Clearly, the spirit is at work. Definitely, and I and I laugh a little bit because I I can hear Kariga's steps as an indicator of his excitement, but then it's like a complete slowdown, and he looks at me, and I'm like just bawling with tears, and he's like he turns around and goes. <laughs> and then I, you know, then I try like to tiptoe downstairs. My tiptoes are very light, but I don't go down with the same pound and step that I do when I run up. But but how? profound is that, right? That you've allowed me that space, that I'm allowed that space, that I'm comfortable in that space, that I can be in that space and be okay with it, right? I think sometimes what happens, at least in the beginning of my grief, I might have said, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, like I'm apologizing about how I'm feeling. But really and truly, that is the truest form of how I'm feeling and, and it should be honored. Yes. I've learned from this process that grief is love. We've said it multiple times, but it, Kamayu taught me that, that grief is the deepest love. I, I saw you see yourself for the very first time after giving birth. And I'm still serving on behalf of that moment. It doesn't take, um, if we acknowledge it, I'd rather acknowledge it operationally, but not like I need it to be acknowledged. Mm. I think it's what a mother is do. I just think the world, it doesn't understand it because per employment and GDP and all these other factors, we see people as means of exporting labor but I believe in the love that she goes to write about. And as I see the world daily, I believe that that love is for us all. So if I can provide space by being attentive, by being service oriented, that allows her to produce writing that is for us all, then that is a mere, that is a mere debt that I'm, no, I'm not done paying and I'm still committed to. I want Felicia to write more. I think her write, I'm a fan of her writing. I actually get my fists kind of clenched. I'm like, damn, that is good. She does it with such a clear precision and a patience for herself that I admire. Sometimes when I'm writing and I ask her like, damn, how do I start this or that? She encouraged me to start from that very point. The place where I don't know how to start. 
and encouraging me to go from there. That's such a powerful opportunity because there's going to be evidence in the I didn't know. There's so much we know. We just don't know how to articulate. And Felicia really um, maximizes that as a practice. Thank you, babe. And I know that I appreciate your compliments. I stand in them. I rest in them. But I also want to be sure to talk about grief um, insofar as it's not only reflective in loss. Mm -hmm. This was a conversation that we kind of tippy-toed on. But it's not just the loss of a loved one. In fact, there's this collective grief that's been happening. Well, one, that's yeah. been happening, but also it exists in other spaces. Um, it can be even, in my experience, I was grieving who I used to be, who I thought I would be, and Kamayu, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. But for some people, it could be they're grieving who they used to be. Mm -hmm. They're grieving who they thought they would be. Mm -hmm. Totally. I was talking to a friend about a, a tour that was canceled mm -hmm. due to COVID. And this artist, you know, if, if, if he... If, if he were to walk in the room today, you would think, you know, we love your music. Like, it's, it's all good. We love you. But hearing so many of my friends experience job loss, job transition, opportunities that they have been preparing their whole lives for not come to fruition, on top of family members who transition, I realized, like, yeah, I understand that the loss of a loved one is grief, but because I understand it so well, it's not just in death. Mm -hmm. It is, sometimes we mourn ourselves. Mm -hmm. What we thought our lived, our reality would be, and how we reconcile that. Mm -hmm. And I just want to make room for anybody who's been on that end of grief, and it hasn't been as sizable, as someone would call as somebody losing a loved one or a parent, we do recognize the impact right, of COVID on families. I, we do understand that. But it's not just the people who aren't here. It's the ones who are here who are trying to reconcile, where do I fit in this? So I just want to take a second to breathe and acknowledge that that can be extremely complicated because nowhere in the world counts it as real. Mm. Nowhere is counting it as real. Everybody's trying to rush you or accelerate you or put you back into this mode. And, you know, you would almost sound incapable or ungrateful or not keeping up with the pace of the world if you say, whoa, I need a minute. But I just want to take a second to say, I see us needing a minute, you needing a minute as valid. Mm -hmm. And if I can encourage you to do that, what God has on the other side of you being willing to take that minute for yourself, it could be a totally new reframe. The ability to look at it differently than you ever have before. So don't let the world rush you. Mm -hmm. If you still need a minute, please take a minute. There is grace there. There is a beautiful art waiting for you there. So with with you saying that, I have an affirmation that I feel like fits that. Okay. And it's an affirmation that I think I've even leaned into in my processing, um, in writing, um, and being okay with not being okay. And it reads, oh, it's on page 14, if you have your text. <laughs> and it reads, I am where I need to be, and I am who I need to be in this very moment. The answers I'm looking for are already within. I am where I need to be, and I am who I need to be in this very moment. The answers I am looking for are already within. Where'd you write that from, Rita? 
it's about if we are seeds, figuratively, literally, a seed comes with all it needs inside of it. But it takes new temperatures, new seasons, new settings for that seed to realize what is inside of it, what it becomes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the answers I'm looking for already within, it affirms that God sent me with what I need inside. It doesn't mean that I have it all at recollection. I may need to be, see, this is the part that hurts. Mm. Seeds, if I've come to know them, like you find out what's inside a seed when it's buried or broken. But there's no way in the world I'm going to sign up and go to God and be like, bury me or break me. Yeah. I'm not doing it. No. I'd rather see what my seed has to offer, but I want to do that from as much comfort as possible, honestly. But the comfort juxtaposes the growth. Seeds actualize from being broken or buried. Situations may feel like you're being buried. Situations may feel like you're being broken. But that reveals the true nature of the seed. So the answers I'm looking for are already within. But it only comes from surrendering mm -hmm. to the season. Mm -hmm. Surrendering to being prostrate. Like, there's no affirmation and negation, Dr. West says. So to not do something, to not be something, is only a delay of clock until you will. But you can't not forever. So whatever it is, we, the not me, not now, not yet, well, at some point is going to be your turn. And so this affirmation follows for me. Maintaining peace on the path is as important as the destination. <laughs> Maintaining peace on the path is as important as the destination. Yeah, but the path is, is hard when you're being broken. Yeah. The path is hard when you're being buried. But I, I, I thank you for bringing those affirmations in. The way you have, because it brings me back to Sometimes art is showing up today differently than you have before. So in this toolkit, there are different habits of mind to help navigate us through different days, what we may be feeling. We've done the album, the deluxe, the podcast that we sit here on now, and now we have Felicia's affirmations to speak to a part of humanity that many don't have the courage to speak to. It's so hard to speak to a mother with a broken heart, whether it's a neonatal loss, or those of us who even got friends who's, who transition, sometimes talking to their mom is one of the hardest things for you to do because you don't know what to say. And you don't have to know what to say. It's, it's the showing up. They know it. What new words can you come to add that they haven't already wrestled in their own minds? What new words do you have to offer that they haven't already bounced from wall to wall? So it's just a courage to show up for them. So in many cases, this toolkit allows us to show up for mothers who we don't have the words for. We can give them to someone who experienced loss. We can connect the stories and build bridges of connection and belongingness. Sophia, I thank you for adding to the catalog of truth-telling, a words to inform us all, especially when we feel maybe most deficit. Well, Riga, I thank you for being an example of what it's like to lean into the process, right? It's not easy to be still. Many don't have the privilege, the luxury, especially if you're living in a black body that is contextualized in and of itself. But I really want to extend my gratitude to you again for making room for me to be able to do this. Mm. And I look forward to watching it grow, that we are still able to create through our journey and leaning into the process habits of mind that can help others love more abundantly. That is the goal. That's the work. That's the work. 
Well, if you thank me, Fee, I want to thank everybody who was with us tonight. Give yourselves a hand. Thank y'all. And I want to I want to say this from a real place. I haven't engaged with the public in this way or any way since September 2019. the level of things that go on in your mind on will the people come? But this isn't just people. I didn't want, I told Fee, realistically, I know you want to grow an audience and grow a new audience, but I don't know if I can do this in front of faces I don't recognize. Mm. There are people who had courage to reach me when I felt most invisible. People who didn't know why they were calling, like, the spirit just led me or you were on my mind. And they call or they offer love at the exact moment. So I'm thanking this audience and I'm thanking the city of Sacramento because in my mind, I haven't seen it done well enough. We hold a very intricate position in how this state works, functions. We hold a rich history. And to live in a black body in Sacramento is such a conundrum because they tell you about this access, they tell you about this diversity, they tell you about this inclusion, and it is elusive. It's named that, but it doesn't have real accessibility. So black folks coming out to explore the practice of loving more abundantly and being well, it speaks so truly to my hope for us to be a, a, a place, a refuge, a city that is known for its capacity to love black people. And I'm talking about how black people love black people. Mm -hmm. I want them to look at us like, damn, they're, they're impenetrable. Their love for one another encapsulate one another. It's really a superpower that's undertapped. And I've seen it happen here over and over and over and over again. And I want it to happen more abundantly. So we thank you for coming to this very special broadcast mm -hmm. of Soul Affirmations Live from the Brick House. Yay. I thank <laughs> you for coming out and supporting Fee and myself and you and the storytellers that are represented on the wall, the photographers, the storytellers who are capturing now. Um, before I close, I want to quote a great writer, author, an orator. Dre T said, thought I was depressed. I was going through oppression. And where that resonates with me, when we love more abundantly, it, it, it separates the veil. When we love more abundantly, it gives us the vision to see mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how powerful and the love is really a tool of our liberation. Mm -hmm. So thank you all for loving us the way you have. Yeah. Thank you for coming out to this broadcast of Soul Affirmations. This particular episode is brought to you by not only myself, and Felicia, but Dre T, executive produced by Tommy and Cody Oliver, produced by Crystal Hill, and edited by my Sue McLemore. Yes. Massive love. May we all love more abundantly. Peace. Peace.